Well, good evening, everyone, um, and welcome. My name's Mark Beasley. I'm the manager of the Geelong Heritage Centre Collection Services here at Geelong Library and Heritage Centre. And on behalf of Geelong Regional Library Corporation, I'd like to welcome you to the library's author event for this evening. The Geelong Regional Library Corporation acknowledges Wadawaro and Eastern Mar original owners of the lands on which our library services operate. We pay respect to Wadawaro and Eastern Mar elders, past, present and emerging. We acknowledge and celebrate First Nation peoples of this land as the custodians of learning, literacy, knowledge and story. Tonight is a very important event. It is the first of many that we are contributing towards this, this year's Australian Heritage Festival. Running for one month from, uh, sorry, from Sunday 8, 18th of April until Wednesday the 19th of May, this annual festival brings together people from across the country from all walks of life and those who have enjoyed discovering heritage for a long time or are just taking their first steps to do so. Celebrate heritage and culture through ceremony, song and dance, performance art, talks and tours, I invite you to browse through the many fantastic online and in-person events on offer this year. Before we begin our discussion tonight, and there will be opportunities for audience questions later, I'd like to give you a little bit of background about myself. I've been a very lucky manager of the Geelong Heritage Centre Collection and Services for the past 14 years here, and I've had more than 20 years managing and working with archive collections, genealogy resources and special collections both locally and internationally. I've assisted in research and appeared on, as an expert on television programs nationally and internationally such as Who Do You Think You Are, Australian series, and Can We Help, ABC Television. Recently I've also been lucky enough to lead uh, the Geelong Wallisden Project uh, to locate and digitally photograph World War I honour boards uh, located across the city of Greater Geelong, the borough of Queenscliff, Golden Plain Shire and Surf Coast Shire areas, which we launched through a major online event on Remembrance Day last year. And that uh, webinar is available on the library's YouTube channel if you want to check out. But that's enough about me. Tonight, our author is Ellie Sinclair. Ali is a Geelong-based writer who is an adventurer at heart and has won multiple awards for her writing. Ali has lived in Argentina, Peru and Canada and has climbed some of the world's highest mountains, worked as a tour guide in South and Central America and has travelled the globe. She enjoys immersing herself in exotic destinations. That's why she's living in Geelong, clearly. <laughs> cultures and languages, but Australia has always been close to Alexander. Ali hosts retreats for writers and presents writing workshops around Australia, as well as working in film on international projects. She's a volunteer role model with Books in Homes and is an ambassador for the Fiji Book Drive. Ali's books explore, explore history, culture, love and grief, and relationships between families, friends and lovers. She captures the romance and thrill of discovering all the new worlds and loves taking readers on a journey of discovery. Please join me in welcoming Ali to talk to us tonight about her latest book, The Code Breakers. together and talk 
you know, sold it to their parents for 20 cents. <laughs> um, and I know I wasn't one of those people who thought, oh, I'm going to be a writer when I grow up, like a lot of my writer friends were. Uh, it wasn't really until I came back from South America and I was being interviewed by a radio journalist and he was asking me about my stories and then afterwards he said, have you ever thought about writing a book? I'm like, no, not really. But then that, that seed got planted and I would, probably maybe two months later I found myself at a, a community writing course and I did that and I wrote three manuscripts that will never ever see the light of day. Um, but my ball line was Lumi Tango and that was my first book that got published and that was definitely my love letter to Argentina. Um, I haven't lived there for a long time but I still miss it daily. Fantastic. Now, your books are published all around the world, uh, including titles translated into German and Serbian. Tell us what has been the publishing journey like for you so far? When I decided I wanted to be published, I thought, oh, I really just want to walk into a bookshop and, and see my book on the shelves. And I was happy just to have my book. Like, that was, that was my goal. And I finally got to that goal and walked into the bookshop store and I thought, gosh, I like this feeling. I think I've been doing this a few more times. So <laughs> now, did you buy it? Did you run to Dubai when you walked in and saw it? Come on. No, I, no, no, I didn't. Oh, okay. But I was, I was actually, <laughs> I was standing um, in the bookshop and crying. <laughs> and the bookshop lady came up to me and she goes, are you, are you okay, dear? It's my first book, it's the first time I've seen it in the shop, and that was so sweet. And this is one of the reasons I love booksellers, because, like, they get it. <laughs> it's so good librarians and readers, but we, we get the love of books and how special it is. So they whipped out, you know, whipped out the camera and they took photos, and it was just such a lovely experience. So I wanted to keep doing it, I still want to keep doing it, so it just doesn't ever really get old. And do you still get teary when you walk into the shop? No, no, I don't get teary. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say, my, my family, I love them dearly, but they don't, they're not huge readers. <laughs> but when the first box of books came, like my very first book, and they're all like, oh yeah, it's like this big celebration and, and you know, opening the book, the book, the box and the books and whatnot. And now, like, you know, when the recent one came, the box arrived, and the kids are like, oh yeah, yeah, what's your deal? Yeah. So, you're over it. Perhaps you get dinner delivered in the box next time. Maybe. That might be true. Um, obviously, this book is what we're here to talk about tonight in particular. What kick-started the creation of the Co-Breakers? What was, where, was the, where was the starting point and why? I wrote a book in 2018 called Bernie Fields, and it was set in 1948 in Queensland. And my main character, I had her working in Brisbane for the Australian Women's Army Service. Um, I didn't have to do a lot of research at that time, but it kind of just stuck in the head. I thought, do you want to find out a little bit more about the kind of work that the women did in Brisbane in World War II? So I started Googling, <coughs> and this really tiny, tiny little article came up about this female co-breaker in Brisbane. I'm like, oh, okay, this sounds interesting. So I went down the rabbit hole of research and I can quite happily spend a long time there. Um, and it took me quite a while, I actually uncovered a story that um, had not been told, especially in fictional form, about these female co-breakers in Brisbane. I'm like, all right, I have to do something with this. And then the story started developing. I just wrote to and said, yep, yeah, that's for me. Yeah, exactly, okay. yeah. Um, How different was the experience of writing the code breakers compared to your previous releases? Because it sounds like you started to go a slightly different direction in a, in a way. Mm. So how different was it writing this particular? This one nearly broke me. <laughs> it was so much research because it wasn't just about the code breakers. I also incorporated um, the history of Qantas. I when I started looking into it, I'm like, oh, I didn't know that Qantas actually worked for the war effort in World War II, they evacuated people and they dropped medical <coughs> supplies and also food to troops in New Guinea. Um, and then also just learning about um, Charleville and I won't give it away, but there's something that happens in Charleville, which is part of history that I didn't know about either. Um, as well, so there was a whole lot of different aspects aside from just 
tiebreakers. Um, and now I forgot what the question was. <laughs> no, it was the experience of writing the tiebreakers. Oh, yeah, the experience. Yeah, so there was a lot more research involved mm -hmm. um, than, than other books. I mean, all my books, I do like to weave a lot of fact into them um, and then build the fictional story and characters around, around that. Um, the, 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 the balancing of the timeline of war and trying to make that fit in with what was happening in my characters' personal lives as well, my editor really, really, yeah, really, you really worked out this one with me. Yeah, you really, <laughs> my reading, you really delved into the history of a period of time, mm. a significant period of time in Australian history. Yeah. Um, and that clearly was going to take you down a re re really long research hole to get that information to for, you know, to for the writing. Yeah, yeah, and, and and also just like the little things too. I think like um, you know with the rations, with the you know and the women used to you know use tea bags to you know stand their legs and draw an eyeline, so they look like they had stockings on. Like they're tiny little things, but they really help bring that authenticity. To yeah, and story. you really do take the reader into that time. You'll immerse into that period, which is really That's good fantastic. To do. Um, tell us about some of the issues that you, you explore in the co writers. Ah, yes, gosh, um, I love stories with issues. <laughs> um, PTSD, which of course wasn't known back then, um, you know, <coughs> comes in lots of different forms, and um, there's a certain thing that happens in the story, I won't give it away. Um, but, it, it's, it was really interesting to explore how it was, you know, I guess, uh, dealt with back then or not dealt with. Yeah, how it was talked about how back then compared about. to now, and you, you, you come that beautifully. Oh, thanks. Yeah, because it's, you know, I'm coming with a, you know, 2021 lens um, and trying to put myself into 1943 and trying to understand how, you know, people dealt with it back then. So, um, yeah, so there's, there's PTSD and, you know, just loss, you know, so many types of loss. And I think one of the hardest things for, for the families and the women back here was that they, you know, they just didn't know what was happening overseas. Like, and and any time, you know, someone walked down the street with, you know, a telegram, it's like, oh, they're going to look at my house. You know, so there was, there was a constant fear. And then, of course, in Brisbane, there was a the whole thing about the Brisbane line, which I had never heard of before either. And so the Brisbane line was um, was discussed in the government. And it was, um, someone said, well, you know what? If, if Australia gets invaded by the Japanese, then maybe what we might need to do is actually concede part of Australia to them in order to you know, maybe keep a bit more peace. So there was a you know, imaginary Brisbane line which actually ran all the way through to parts of Western Australia and Northern Territory as well. And uh, speaking to people who had actually lived through World War II in Brisbane, it was a real fear. And even though you know, the government's not always not going to happen, they always worried that actually you know, the government could change their mind if it, if it did happen. So there's this constant worry, you know, it's always something in the back of their minds, even if they tried to live, you know, regular lives as almost much as they could during the war. Now, Ali, the main character, has got, there's, there's a lot of issues that she's working through <laughs> in the book. Do you want to touch on a couple of, well, there's, there's a main one, it, and it's particularly topical, I think, this, this period of our history right now. But do you want to touch on, on that a bit? In, 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 oh, in terms of her career. Oh, yeah. 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 So Ellie is, um, is the kind of girl who doesn't take no for an answer. Um, she, she has dreams and she doesn't see why she can't achieve them. Um, and she, so she really, really tries hard to, um, I guess, break through that glass ceiling. And um, at one point, you know, she dreams of becoming a pilot. But you know, there was no commercial pilots um, back then that were female, and that didn't stop her at all anyway. And she also wanted to be a bit of a trailblazer as well and, and pave the way for others who may not have the strength or, or the voice or the support that she had as well um, for that. And um, there's also uh, another time when she's working with the men, gets 
put into a different department. And you know, some of them were great about it, and you know, they were like, "Okay, you're here to help, and great, we really need more hands on deck." And then there's the odd one who has a massive issue with it and thinks that you know, women are not <laughs> not not very good code breakers at all. Um, which is actually really interesting because I think I touched on it there. Is there's a there was a lady um, in World War Two called Mrs Mack, and she lived in Sydney, and she actually trained a lot of women in um, Morse code, and she was so good that the Navy actually came and spoke with her, and they were so impressed by the quality of training for these women um, that they actually ended up sending quite a lot of men. To, to go and get trained by her as well. So yeah, she's and she's a real life person, which is amazing. Now before I start my next question, I know you've got some slides you want to oh, yes. fly through too while we're chatting away, so some nice pics there. Okay. Um, do you have a particular affinity or an affinity with a particular character in the book? Uh, I love Lewis. Lewis is, Lewis is a friend of Ellie's and she's, he's actually um, her deceased brother's best friend and he really looks out for her and I like the banter that Ellie and, and, and Lewis have um, and he, he likes to, you know, set her straight if she's just, you know, being a bit ridiculous like a good friend would. You hope they, you know, <laughs> each other if you're going off the rails. Um, but for me, yeah, I mean Ellie, like she, she's, she's definitely a combination of the real life co-working women who I have gotten to know, um, and they all have a very similar trait. They're all, they just sort of went about their business, they, they knew that they had a job to do, and, and they did it, and they did it without any complaints, and just got on with it, and um, just strength, strength and silence, right? Strength in, in what they did, and they never really... Well, I couldn't boast about it, but I don't, even if they could talk about it, they would never have said, hey, this is what I've done. I think they just did their work, because, yeah. Alice the Stroller, uh, there's a character in there that I really like, and it's Mrs. Hanley. Oh, Mrs. Hanley! She's gorgeous. But, yeah, I just picture Mrs. Hanley, I think, because you know, your grandmother and your grandmother, like, they've been all the days staying in your grandmother's house. Yeah. I see Mrs. Hanley, I've seen her, and I'm like, oh, yeah. She's just that beautiful, warm person that looks after you. Yeah. The doors are always open and stuff and cooking. I gravitated to this. Yeah. And I love that she takes in the strays on Sundays. Mm -hmm. It's like a stray Sunday. So, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because she, you know, I mean, she has lost her boys in the war and, you know, lost her husband. Um, and she just can't stand the, idea, the thought of, you know, someone being in a foreign country like you know, the American troops and, you know, not having a home cooked meal. So, yeah, taking the stray Sunday is her thing. <laughs> um, now, we touched on um, the research side of it a little bit earlier. Was there a particular, was something that really surprised you from the re when, you, when you delved into the research? Um, and I'd like to know a little bit more about how did you go about the research? Who's involved in the research? Because this is the stuff that goes on behind that no one sort of yeah. thinks much about. Yeah. Um, I, well, initially, of course, you know, what surprised me was we had female co writers and we didn't know about it. That was the biggest surprise. Um, but then as I sort of started delving into it, um, you know, learning about, you know, General MacArthur and how he put together Central Bureau, which is who the women worked for. Um, and it was in suburban Brisbane. It was just amazing. Like, I, I thought, heck, like the, the neighbours, you know, like, they obviously saw, you know, people going in and out in, you know, troop trucks, which, you know, wasn't that uncommon to have places seconded, but they would never have had a clue, you know, some of the country's biggest secrets were, you know, only a few feet away. Yeah, in this magnificent house which you've got. Oh yes, yes. So this is this is actually the house where um, the men worked. This is a place called Narambla, um, and it's in Ascot. And, and as Ascot is as fancy as it sounds. Um, it's a beautiful leaky suburb. Um, it is actually a private residence, um, but one of the great things about being a writer is it can open a lot of doors, literally. So I actually contacted the owners uh, a couple of years ago uh, when I was in Brisbane and I asked, I told them what I was doing and I asked if it was possible to perhaps come and, and visit. Um, and they, of course, knew the history of the house. Um, they said, sure, 
Come on in. So, so this is a photo I took, um, and so this is where the men worked um, in this beautiful, beautiful mansion. Um, it actually, it's just gone up for sale. So if anyone's got a few million, um, make a really great co this museum. Um, and at the back of the property, this is a little garage. This is actually being rebuilt, but it's actually on the footprint of the original garage. And the original garage was fibro and iron, very, very hot in summer and apparently quite cold in winter. Um, before the uh, women of Central Bureau actually um, were in the garage, um, there was another group, the um, women, I was there off, Women's Australian Auxiliary Air Force. They worked on Australia's first IBMs and they also worked with code and they worked in this little garage and because it was such a small garage everything overheated. So they brought in these fans and the fans were so noisy that all the neighbours were asking questions and like what is going on next door? So they actually then had to move all of that about two lots away to the local abandoned fire station which was next to a park. Uh, so they were there and then the other women, the co-breaking women, <coughs> came into, into here and they, they did actually call themselves a garage girls. Like they, they coined the phrase and even now like when they have gone to some of their reunions, like you know, the, the men who work in the house will be like, oh here comes the garage the girls. Garage girls. <laughs> now is the house heritage listed? Do you know? Is yes, yes it is, it is. So um, uh, it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, if you go online and you actually look up 21 Henry Street, there's a video that is inside inside the house. Do you want me to do more of the photos? All right, the show and tell. So um, this is a photo of some of our lovely co-breakers. Um, the lady in the middle is Coral, and Coral is uh, one of the co-breakers who I've gotten to know extremely, extremely well. Um, so this is the women just um, at their army barracks there. And a lot of these women were like 19, 20 years old. They were mostly um, from regional areas, um, you know, very much um, into their family and like family values. Quite a few of them um, were, you know, church goers. Uh, and I have asked a few of them, like, why do you think you were chosen, aside from just having a great brain for it. Um, they all kind of feel that they were chosen because of their family background, um, that they were, you know, the trustworthy type. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's a few more of our lovely code breakers there. And the lady in the middle is Helen Frizzell, and she was, she was their boss. Yeah, and she, yeah, she was amazing. She actually ended up becoming a really, really amazing journalist and um, worked in journalism for many, many years. And kept the secret. And kept the secret. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's all about exposing secrets. So this is um, a photo of the ladies just outside of of Um Actually, someone said to me the other day, they said, "Well, this is supposed to be a top se yeah, secret place. Why are they taking photos of the front?" But uh, obviously, they thought they could get away with it. <laughs> but the place now has like um, you know a big. Um, big fence and hedges yeah. and it's all, all closed off. But there is a lovely park out the front which was unveiled a few years ago. So the women used to actually travel from their barracks in Chermside and in an army truck and they'd be trucked in to, to Narambla and they would actually sing songs, like they'd sing the top 40 songs. And, and that was one of the, the things that I loved about being able to talk to these real life crowd breakers is these little details. So. Um, they used to sing songs just to just, you know, I guess get in the mood, just shake it all out before they then got on with their, their serious business. You do take some bit of a musical journey <laughs> with their singing in yeah. the back of the truck. Yeah. Through the book. Um, there's potentially an album there. Uh -huh. yeah, 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 that's an idea. <laughs> I see, yeah, I, music definitely features in, in all my books. So. Um, but these are the ladies with some of the top drivers actually, who obviously listen to their dulcet tones. And this is Bletchley Park. So um, Central Bureau did do a lot of work with, with Bletchley Park. 
And uh, I just got the best story yesterday. So um, last week there was a really great article in Women's Day about um, Coral and the Code Breakers. And the journalist, Emma, contacted me yesterday and she said, my auntie knows a lady who worked at Bletchley Park and she read my article and she wants to get in contact wow. with the Australian Code Breakers. So in the 90s, they make the penthouse. Yeah. Yeah. How cute is that? <laughs> So I was lucky enough to go to Lipson Park um, in 2019 to go and do some research um, because one of the things that um, the women worked on are the Typex machines and I have tried and tried and tried and tried and not found one in Australia. So I was actually able to see them in Bletchley Park, so this is one of them. Um, so I was actually able to talk to one of the staff members there and he took me through the whole thing as to how it all works and it made a huge, huge difference. So we have an absolutely yeah. sight you need and it comes through in, in the book. Yeah, and you, you, yeah. Get, you, you can you actually see them there working it. I think, and that's you know that, that's that, that's an important aspect when you're trying to understand um, the history, you know, the history behind it, and, and what they're doing, and the fact that it's so secretive that you can tell that story and sort of feel a bit as a reader, you know, I'm sort of privileged here and finding out what's going on. It's like you're in on the scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah it was it was it was really great to be able to to actually see that firsthand. Just a couple of more about gorgeous girls. And then this is them out the front of the rebuilt garage. Um, and um, the gentleman there um, was um, was their boss. So this was probably taken um, 10, 15 years ago. So they were able to do some reunions, but they were very secret reunions. We still don't know about them. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. And we've got one more. This is Coral. And this is her just uh, just after she joined the army. And this is Coral now. She's 96 years young. And she makes a mean cup of tea. <laughs> and then I was able to finally give Coral the book. Yeah, so um, yeah, so the women have been absolutely amazing in helping with the research. I definitely couldn't have done it without them. So tell us what were some of the most challenging and rewarding aspects of writing this particular book? Definitely timelines and um, just getting the information because a lot of the information was, was so difficult. Um, going back to people I spoke to with research, I actually managed to um, talk with, he's the ex-head of the Australian Signals Directorate and he's Central Bureau Historian and just a wealth of information. So we, we had a bit of a hotline, and I'd be saying, Oh, look, I'm trying to find information on such and such. Yeah, leave it with me. And he'd come back, and I'd have this, like, you know, three pages <laughs> of information. It was just amazing. But just to have access to that kind of information um, was, was really wonderful. Um, but I think one of the challenges, too, is you can actually do too much research because then you don't know. <laughs> how much or how little to put in. So quite often my lovely editor will say to me, you know, Ali, those four paragraphs, while they were interesting, I reckon we probably could have gone with, you know, knowing that in two sentences. So oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know you've researched it, but <laughs> yeah, so I think learning what to leave out has, has, been, a challenge. has been a challenge. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now friendship plays an important role in, in this story. Why was this such an important element when creating the code breakers for you? Uh, because it was, it was the theme that came up with all the women that I spoke with because they were living with each other at the army barracks, they were working with each other and they only had each other. They were, they were only people that they could talk to about what they were doing. So it was such an intense time in their lives. And all of these women also had a lot of independence for the first time. You know, they're away from family and they're in Brisbane, there's another thousand international troops there. Um, they, they, actually, I mean, they, they were doing serious work, but they also had a really great chance to let their hair down. Um, but each woman I spoke to, the thing that they remembered the most, the thing that was the most important to them, um, aside from obviously you know, helping the allies win, was friendships. Mm. 
It's all about the features. The bottle that created in that, in that space, in mm. that house and space, yeah. Um, but, and I know we've probably touched on this but part of your research is obviously involved speaking with the real life code makers, the real heroes. How hard was it to find them and what did you learn from them? Oh, it's impossible. To, well, no, it wasn't impossible, but it, it was really hard to, to find them. Um, they don't hang out on Instagram, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, I found a really fantastic non-fiction book uh, written by David Dufty and uh, it's a secret Secret Lives of Australia's Code Breakers, if you really want to get technical. Um, and so I, went, I read his book, loved it, and so I contacted him and I said, well, I'm writing a fictional story about these code breaking women, I'm, and he had written a little bit about them and what they did. So what are the chances that you know you might be able to introduce me to one or two? So he, you know, he was great, he sort of vetted me for a little bit until he felt comfortable, you know, I wasn't some weirdo. And then, um, yeah, then he put me in contact with one of the co breakers. We had a really great conversation, and she gave me the phone numbers of the others. And it just, yeah, but it took me a good six months to, to finally track them, track them down. But it was, it was worth it. And uh, just learning about uh, just their backgrounds as well, like the kind of lives they had before. That and when that happened, see when you first touched base with them, but yeah, was there still that? That not fear, but the fact that they've lived in such a secret, you know, secret bond and secret mm. life for such a long time, mm. were they apprehensive to open up to you at first, and did they really have to feel like, yeah, this is okay, I can do this now? Or yeah, one one um, still is a bit apprehensive. So um, yeah, we keep in contact, but I she doesn't get involved in media or anything like that. Um, and she's she's happy to, to do that, and I. And she was having to help me out with, you know, um, information. Um, but she's just kind of like, oh, you know, it was all in the past. I'm not bothered by it anymore. Um, but the others, it was like, you know, the Pandora's box opening. Like, wow, oh, yeah, I can finally talk about it. And someone is listening and they're asking questions and they want to help the, our legacy live on. Um, and they are loving the limelight right now. <laughs> <laughs> and why not? I mean, yeah. They're, as, as you, you know, touch on, their heroes um, who haven't really haven't been recognised in the way they should be. Mm. Um, they're not alone in that. And there's, you know, there's many others in that in that space. Um, but I was interested because I wondered if the apprehension um, would be a factor with them. You know, you, you, you hear about so many um, service men and women. Mm -hmm. Who come back and don't just purely don't talk about what happened. Yeah. They're in that same that same space again in a different way, yeah. but they've had to maintain a secret, absolute secret, yeah. for so long that you know think, well, do I or can I or you know, can I talk about this now? Yeah. But it's interesting you're saying that for them it's a lot of most of it's been a cathartic. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's just not all out because there are still some things they can't talk about. Yeah. And and one of the reasons that they were asked to sign the Official Secrets Act was, um, and, and why it lasted so long, is because a lot of the work that they were doing during World War II was still being used um, post post war. So you know the whole Cold War era. Mm -hmm. So it, it actually was still quite relevant for quite a long time after the war. Mm -hmm. um, the work that they did. And that's something I've got in common with them. Just prior to coming here, I worked at National Archives, and I had to sign oh, Official right. Secrets Act. Yeah. It had to be fully vetted, and it, it actually happened every couple of years, but you had to sign that, that act that you would not release information apart from what you were permitted to. So I, mm. I have a sort of, a, you know, I can understand where they're coming from, not to the degree. That so you have some secrets too. Plenty. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <I'm shocked. laughs> um, Moving right along. Um, <laughs> I will do. Um, what is one thing that you'd like your audience to take away from the experience of reading the code records? I think it would be to have an appreciation for what went on on Australian soil during World War II. Um, a lot of the focus, um, rightly so, has been. Um, on things happening overseas and a lot of what the men were doing. But I think this story 
really highlights the strength of the women and um, the families back here and, and the men who were back here also in supporting roles um, to just, you know, I guess have an appreciation that there was a different kind of war on, on our soil and there were a lot of worries and there was still, you know, quite a lot of danger as well. Um, and just have an appreciation for the kind of work that um, not only these co workers but a whole lot of other women in Australia and Australia did. Beautiful. Now, um, our beautiful audience tonight, please get your heads around the questions if you may wish to ask, because I've only got a couple more things that I'm going to talk to Ali about, so I'm going to give you plenty of time to ask questions, so now's the time to formulate those questions. <laughs> Before I ask you about your um, current role in the screen industry, which sounds fascinating, I'd like a couple of words that I'm going to throw some character names to you, catch I did so when do this. Some of my favourites are not, not all characters, obviously, and then a couple of the places that we touched on. Um, Ali, just need a couple of words. How would you just, just describe or, or something about it that struck a chord with you? Strong and caring. Okay. Cat Arnold. Oh, forever romantic. Flory. Flory Jeffries. Oh, Flory. Complex and loyal. And his best friend, yeah. Louis is so obviously a favourite, Louis. Hubba. <laughs> <laughs> Corporal Sam Wesley, who's oh. a Louis as well. Oh, he's a romantic as well. Yeah. yeah. Sergeant Leonard Cooper. <sighs> the American. Yeah. Oh, gosh, how do I describe you? Um, Caring and worldly. Yeah. My, one of my favourites, Mrs. Hanley. Oh, a teddy bear. <laughs> yeah. As a collective, and I, I, the names, you know, Lily and Cassandra Vivian from Queenscliff, the Queenscliff from there. <laughs> Our Joyce had a garage girls as a collective. How would you? I just are very special, strong, smart women. Maud. Maud. Well, oh, watch out for Maud. Yes. <laughs> Harry Kingsman. Harry, oh, the tortured soul. Mm. And finally, my other favourites, the Rottweilers. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> the Rottweilers. I actually just... did get called the Rottweilers. Yeah. Yes, um, misunderstood. <laughs> I just picture them there. Some of the places, and I don't think, you know, I, I, I enjoy um, when you go into the story and touching and going back inside of those places. And there's some unusual ones there, like the like, you know, Mossman Department Store. How did you come across, we, how did you write about Mossman Department Store? What did you do to, to take us inside that store and people inside the store? That, yeah, um, well, yeah, it must have been fictional, but in my head, um, it was it just reminded me, you know, like that old mire, mm -hmm. you know, like that, that old kind of department store with the, the cafeterias and, um, yeah, yeah. And Charleville? Charleville, oh yeah, I love, I love the outback. Um, yeah, that was really fascinating to write about, especially when I found out about this, this uh, army base there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I like the remoteness of it. And I think that kind of fit Ellie, Ellie's mood afterwards, after the war, for mm. her to move there because she needed to remove herself from right. Brisbane. Very good, thank you. Now, tell us a bit, well, tell us as much as you like, about your current involvement <laughs> in the screen industry. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's something I've really gotten into over the last couple of years. Um, I think it's just always been there. Um, and so now, you know, when I'm landing on the couch, and, it's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm researching. <laughs> so, um, but I have, I got involved with a, a short film a couple of years ago and um, just being on set was just such a, a, a great buzz and my last book, The Cinema at Starlight Creek, um, is actually set on a film set and uh, one of my uh, lovely friends, her uncle is um, a director, so I actually got to go on to the set of Wentworth um, for a while. And that was such a buzz. I thought, right, this is it. I, I wanted to get into another form of storytelling as well. So for the last, uh, 
gosh, almost a year now. I've been working with a producer in LA. We work on a couple of different projects. Um, and I've also been doing a lot of screenwriting. And there's also a documentary um, as well that I'm working on, which will incorporate part of the story of the oh, Black Black oh, Woman. So, I mean, we've got a broadcast down. Um, very interested. That's all I can say. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so it's it's really fun, like, you know, being able to take stories to yeah. a, different, a different medium. Because the, the Bletchley Circle touches on the, the women working at uh, Bletchley Park mm. in the UK <laughs> in, that, in that series post. So that's interesting that you're that this suggestion that part of this or the story might be something that comes to life on the screen. Yeah, well, it's it's getting a lot of interest. Very good. <laughs> so sure, it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic story, and yeah, I can, I can understand why. Um, Q and A time with our beautiful audience. And I can see it now before we start because we're recording. There's some microphones going around. So before you ask your question, if you just want to grab the microphone. Hi. Uh, did your ladies actually work with Alan Turing and to break the Enigma, Enigma code? Or is this a different story altogether? Yeah, it's, it's a different story. So they um, worked mostly on the Japanese Morse code. Um, so they, even though they sent messages to and from Bletchley Park and other allied outposts, um, a lot of it was um, code that had been intercepted um, by the signals intelligence um, that was code being set between the Japanese, um, so the Army and the Air Force. Thank you. Questions? Oh, very shy. I would go. Just wait for the microphone. If it, I don't think it's actually me. I'm pretty loud. I can do it before. Yeah, so I mean, we'll grab the gentleman at the back and then we'll get the microphone to you at the front there, okay? <laughs> yes, lots of us. But um, could you tell us a bit more about this whole secrecy thing? My dad was actually involved in this too and um, didn't tell anybody, including his younger brother, who we found out after some like 50 odd years who was doing the same thing. How did these ladies deal with that? I mean, you've mentioned a little bit, but I mean, they had to leave their friends and yeah, it was really interesting to um, to speak to each of the women and how they dealt with it. Um, some of them were sort of, you know, really quite happy to return to de domestic life and pretend it didn't sort of happen. Um, others felt like there was a wedge um, between themselves and their loved ones because they could never fully give themselves 100%. And that's one thing that um, a few of my characters found really hard to deal with. Um, um, one, of, one of the co-bakers I spoke to, she actually moved to England and she, she was engaged and um, after the war said, I just need to go, I just, I just need to, you know, just move away for a little bit. I only intended to go for, you know, a few months, went six <coughs> years, but her fiance waited and came back and she was, you know, in a much better space and they got married and they were married for decades but she still couldn't tell him what happened. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, so it, it's really interesting to explore how keeping a secret, even though there's very, very good reasons for keeping those secrets, um, can have such a massive impact. And that, that was one thing I really wanted to explore in the book as well. Because I honestly couldn't imagine having to keep a secret for 50 years. No, and then what I was touching on earlier with, you know, when, you, when we've done research into both World War, particularly World War I, um, recently that, you know, nearly every serviceman and woman would, come, would have come back and kept information to mm. themselves. They're not going to tell the whole story, um, and it's purely because of the circumstance they're put in. And it's probably, it's unfortunate that the circumstance then, I think, motivates or makes the keeping of the secret or not revealing it easier in a way. You know, it's not that they don't feel like they're lying, it's I've just got to, I can't tell anybody that. So I'm not lying, I'm just keeping it to myself because I don't want to hurt people or I can't reveal what really happened. Yeah, yeah, and it is, it's, it's, 
I think it depends, yeah, on personality, but yeah, I, that was the impression I got up to when I was speaking with women. It was like they just, it was just the damn thing, they just, just didn't talk about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, your question at the front here. Something I've been dying to ask is with the real co brothers did they maintain friendship after the war or did they choose to just move on with their lives and leave that in the past? A bit of both. Um, they, they, well, certainly the, the co-breakers I've spoken to, because there's only three remaining co-breakers, they're all in their 90s now, out of about 36. Um, they're all besties now. Um, after the war, like quite a few of them sort of, you know, stepped back for a little while. But it's, it's interesting because they did all eventually find each other, you know, again. And, and they did have reunions, um, secret reunions for quite some time. Um, but yeah, the, the friendships that they made in, the, in that moment in time are, are probably the, their most precious friendships for sure. Thank you. Good, great question. What else have we got? Um, you were both really easy to listen to, and it was lovely. If you write, um, Linda, if you write how you speak, I think the book will sound amazing. Oh, thank you. Sounds amazing. Um, my question is, um, how did they select the women? Did they, um, obviously they didn't have seek.com. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wondered if it was an advert in the paper, or, because it's sort of a secret thing, but you need to put it out there, so it sounds like it would be challenging. Yeah, well, um, the woman I spoke to didn't know they were doing a test for Central Bureau. So um, uh, they had just joined the, you know, the Australian Women's Army Service and they, uh, you know, just kind of went through the regular testing and, and that sort of stuff. But obviously, you know, there were certain things in those tests that people, and, and also looking at personalities and that, so there were obviously a lot of very secret selection things going on in the background that they weren't aware of. Um, and a few of them did training in Melbourne um, at Fortman Park and were then told, all right, you, you're being posted to Brisbane. You're going on the train, you're going to Brisbane. They went to Brisbane and then they were then sent to Central Bureau. And it was only then, when they are actually on the grounds, that they were told about what they were doing. Yes. So with your book illustration cover, is that like how you pictured her or is that the artist impression and then they just showed you or did you have input into saying that's how you wanted her to look? Yeah, um, I am so lucky um, with my publisher, they do the best covers. So the cover artist is really fantastic. So she, she often will read the book and get a bit of a feel for it. And, the thing with um, with my with publishers, with traditional publishers, is it's not just one person's opinion with the cover. So they have, you know, oh, I do get a bit of input, um, and but this one was pretty much exactly how I imagined it to be. It, just, it captured, you know, that story. I, I thought it captured the story really well. But when they're designing on the cover, there's um, there's the editor, there's the publisher, there's people who work in sales, in marketing, in PR. Um, it, it, there's a whole lot of people involved in the process and it's only once it's kind of gone through their process that, that they then come to me and go, what do you think? <laughs> so, but they, I mean, they, they've, they've been really great covers. I've been really lucky and happy with the covers I've been, been given. But yeah, I mean, I always get a chance to say, oh, can we just tweak this or tweak that? Or, um, so it, it's a really great collaborative process. Yeah. Is there someone you think it looks like? Because I don't. Yeah, I do too. I'm interested yeah. to know. Who are you? Kira Knightley. Kate Winslet. Yes, that's right. That's right. I, 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 yeah, I tell everyone I'm Kate Winslet's yeah. sister. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah um, having read the book, I'm going to pump up your toes a little bit here. Um, oh, I, I actually come from a from a signals background, so I'm a, I'm a former soldier, and I think. There's so, so many books on the heavy hitters, the guys that are up the front, the war fighters, that kind of thing, umpteen books about that. People forget about what's behind that army, the logistics, signals, intelligence. 
you don't know what the end is doing if you haven't got to dig in. So I think it's a great subject, well covered. And the other thing too is people forget that women also served. Like most of the units that I served in, I served alongside women, and essentially they were doing essential jobs. So well done to you. I think you've done an amazing job with the book. Thank you. Fascinating in a way that the, these women were chosen to do this particular role in particular. Specifically, because I actually don't reckon the men would have been able to actually do the code breaking to the same extent. I reckon that the female mind and being able to think laterally, um, and, and some of the storyline comes through when they're trying to figure out a particular but yeah. they give it away. I think that comes through. So I think it's, it's, I think it's fascinating and probably a very smart decision somewhere that they chose. 36 women to be the co directors. And clearly, the same applied in the UK. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We've got to ask. Yeah. Um, we've got a couple more questions. Yes, the gentleman there. Ali, with um, the co directors, fantastic book. What I like to take away from it is that you've captured another part of the tiny jigsaw, which is World War II, and one that we've discussed that hasn't really had much publicity or life because of secrecy. But what I really love is the fact that we wouldn't have had too many more years to capture these anecdotes. So what you've done, you've popularised fiction in their story, but you've captured the authenticity. And I think on a scale of 1 to 10, how proud will you be when they're all gone that you've captured? Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And, and, and you know, like, because yeah, they had read the book, um, and I was petrified. <laughs> I mean, I mean they just pulled me all the way through. I was like, but, oh, you know, I mean, yeah, I wanted to, to do their story justice and have this legacy to live on when we, you know, eventually do lose them. Um, so, yes, when, when they, I knew they were reading it, and then, you know, when their name popped up on my screen, I'm like, <laughs> but I got, got their approval and they loved it and they loved going, they loved going back in time and um, and it, it did take them back into to those moments and so that was the best the best review I could ever have had because you know I'm sure they would have told me if I'd gotten something wrong. <laughs> Thank you, Ali, um, for joining us and for the wonderful insights into your extensive research and preparation for writing the code breakers. Um, it is a fascinating book um, that I absolutely thoroughly enjoy reading. Thank you. Uh, and I'm sure it's going to sell particularly well. Um, and I particularly enjoyed those behind the scenes photographs that you shared with us tonight. Um, we're lucky enough to have Dick's Warren Bonds here tonight selling books, um, copies of, sorry, of Ali's books. Uh, in particular, obviously, the code breakers. And I would just remind everybody that Mother's Day is coming up. Yeah. Yeah. This yes. is a cracking good book for your mother. I wish the kids were here, but I'll have to buy it for mum, I know it. Um, so, yeah, just plant that thought in particular. Um, so, so, tonight, obviously, if you purchase a copy, um, Alex will sign up for it, which is the great bonus. Um, before we leave, um, thank you everyone for coming along and on behalf of John Rich and Libraries, we hope to see you again soon.